I feel better in my own skin now than I did 30 years ago by far. We are making progress, but by no way are we equal. People kind of go, ooh, she still has a good sex life with her husband and look how old they are. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Marissa Lennox. Welcome to The Zoomer. I'm Marissa Lennox. On today's show, we get real about what aging really looks like for women, and in doing so, seek to shed any negative stereotypes, unconscious societal bias, and misconceptions associated with age. We've convened an all-star female panel to discuss issues confronted by aging women, including beauty, sex, age, and ageism. But before we dive in, let's tee up the topic. Every March, we celebrate the contributions of history-making women to our society. Here are a few facts about women in Canada. There are over 19 million women and girls. 19% are women 65 and older. Women in Canada work hard at home, in the workforce, and in their communities. They are public servants. Women hold 29% of seats in federal parliament and 49% of ministerial positions. They are mothers. Over 9 million women are biological, adoptive, or stepmothers to at least one child. They are workers. 60% of women over 15 participate in the labor force. They are heroes who make up a high proportion of COVID frontline workers, including 75% of educators, 87% of registered nurses, and 41% of physicians. So, cheers to all the women who inspire and uplift. We celebrate you. Now, before we get started, I want to clarify that we have abided by all of the health and safety protocols, and we here at the Roundtable are appropriately distanced. Now, ladies, thank you for being here in studio, and, and those that are remote, thank you for being here. You're all independently successful, powerful women. And so I want to ask, how has aging been, particularly aging as a woman, or are those two things mutually exclusive? Uh, Jane, why don't I start with you? I've enjoyed aging, I have to say. I have no problem with saying how old I am, 55, and uh, I, I feel better in my own skin now than I did 30 years ago by far. Much more secure, much more, um, just much more in tune with myself and just happy to be with myself. Sam, how about you? Have you enjoyed being a woman and aging? Absolutely. I think part of it, too, is that I'm with someone who uh, ageism is, is not a factor in our lives. And I also work at a place where ageism uh, doesn't exist. So there's so much support around me to just be exactly who I am. And like Jane was saying, I tend to be closer to myself these days than I've ever been in my life. You know, research shows that women are, in fact, happier as they age in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Barbara, I'll go to you on this one. You know, how has it been for you? Aging in the public eye is never easy, but you've done it so well. I think aging is absolutely ghastly. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, and aging in the age of COVID is, is another thing as well. But the really difficult thing about aging for a woman is not only the physical appearance, it's that your mind remains young because of all the AIDS we have, hormones, that sort of thing, but your body won't do what your mind wants it to do. And that for me is the real problem of aging. You know, I, I, as we age, we have, uh, you know, intelligence, experience, humor. Those are things I think that come with age and that makes women in their 50s, 60s, 70s a uniquely attractive and I think powerful demographic. Is that celebrated enough? Uh, Dr. Andrea. I think that we have come a long way as women in the last 100 years. And I think that women are increasingly being celebrated. And I believe that that is continuing on across the entire lifespan. And so I was absolutely privileged enough to grow up in a family with strong women, experiencing strong women all around me. And having that um, in my environment really inspired me to know and to feel in my heart that 
that there is no glass ceiling in my world that the sky's the limit and then I can be and do whatever I desire. Carmelia, why don't I bring you in here? What's your take on all of this? You know, when it comes to dating, I tend to work, when I'm working with women over 50, it's sort of mixed. There are some women over 50 that celebrate their age and are happy to date men in their age range. And then I, I speak to women that have concerns about ageism and feeling as if the only men that are attracted to a woman in their age are ones that are ready to like, you know, leave the planet or that they are undesirable and old. And so that tends to be an issue is women being concerned that their age is going to um, limit them from being able to meet attractive, vital uh, partners. Uh, they fear that these men are going to choose women that are much younger. And in some cases, they will, depends on the man. And in other cases, not so much. Well, and maybe the woman wants to date somebody who's younger, and that's all right. Yes, and that's also true. A lot of women will say, I don't want to date a man my age. So it works both ways. It's not about gender. It's really their perspective and who they feel they are. If they feel they're great for their age, then they want to meet somebody that can meet them at their physical level. There's always a gap, isn't there, between the changing values of society and how fast society takes them up. You can see that with the whole weight thing. We've got wonderful models like Ashley Graham, and she's terrific, but I don't think that's really percolated down to society as a whole. So the larger woman isn't yet fully accepted. In terms of dating younger people, I've lived with a younger man, 15 years younger than myself, and I would suggest to women that on the whole, unless you're prepared to keep your stomach in the whole time, you won't do it. <laughs> uh, but I, you know, I, I don't think in terms of age, I'm, I'm 80 years old now, I'm very happily married, but were I single, um, I would think myself undesirable to any man who had any common sense. But if I was 70, I would not. At the age of 70, I felt as young as I did at the age of 50 or 40. But there comes a threshold, and I think that threshold is when you hit that terrible 8-0, where you feel that you've dropped out of society. All right, we need to take a short break. We'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. Women don't like female news anchors because they feel like the woman is talking down to them. Welcome to a brand new way to start your day with good friends and the greatest music. You recognize these voices. It's the Morning Zoom. Remember that name, the Morning Zoom with Sam and Jane. Here we are, Sam, talking <laughs> together after a very long time, so uh, broadcasting true. from different places. I'm here at the Zoomerplex, and you're home in the interest of public safety. And you and I have a brand new morning show, two women on the radio together. <laughs> Which I, yeah, <laughs> that was my husband cheering in the background. So thanks, honey. Yeah, appreciate that. You know what? I am so excited about this. I find it astonishing, Jane, that you would even have to say that we're two women in a morning show and that we can't think of another two women who lead a morning show. Moses had a vision. And after seeing so many television programs where women co-host and are on panels together talking about the issues of the day, Moses said, wait a minute, we don't have this in Canadian radio, certainly not in Toronto radio. Why don't we have Sam and Jane host the very first all-woman Toronto morning show? Because those girls can talk. <laughs> Welcome back. That was a snippet from the morning Zoom with Sam and Jane on Zoomer Radio. The first all-female morning show in a major market, Toronto, and in a time slot usually dominated by men. Ladies, congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. You know, Thank this you. is radio, it, it just is. It's sort of this male-dominated industry, and and, you know, here you two are, you're not just doing it, you are, you're killing it, you're crushing it. Uh, so congratulations. <laughs> What's that like, Jane? We, uh, I, I think, when I think back to when I got 
into radio as a young woman, I can remember men in the industry telling me that, oh, you can't have two women on the air together. They'll sound like the same person. Similar generation of men also told me women don't like female news anchors because they feel like the woman is talking down to them. I believe that as a young woman in my early 20s. And it has taken all of this time for management and radio, and in this case, Moses Neimer, to say, well, no, you don't sound the same. You sound like different people. And women like to listen to women on the radio. Sam, how about you? I mean, we both work at the Zoomerplex, and I, and I have to say, uh, you know, Moses Neimer is, is incredible to women. He praises women. So I don't feel like we have a glass ceiling here at the Zoomerplex, but, you know, you being in sort of this, again, male-dominated profession and doing it so well, um, is it empowering? It's very empowering. Uh, it's interesting, the reaction we've had from listeners. Lots of celebrations. I will say more men than women have said it's about time, which I found very surprising. And um, women are a little slower to go along. I don't know if women are, are harder on other women, right? It's interesting. And I seem to be trying to play to both, but even just hearing that clip at the beginning of the segment made me so happy. It's like, I want to listen to those two women. Who are they? <laughs> oh, wait, they're me and Jane, you know? It's just really exciting. It feels so good. And we're there for the laughs and we're there. You know what? Women like smart, funny women and men like smart, funny women. So we're not isolating any gender. We're welcoming everybody into the room if you're smart and funny or think you are and just want to be entertained. Barbara, you too made it in a male dominated industry. Uh, it's funny. I, I, I really don't want to sound supercilious here, so please don't think it, but I never thought about glass ceilings and I never thought about them from the time I was a child. And perhaps that's the benefit of growing up in a household in Europe where women just had to work um, before the war and after the war. The only time I ever ran into a problem was when I discovered that men were getting paid more for the same job than I was or that the people I was teaching were getting paid more. That was irritating. But otherwise, um, and I did find when I was editor of the Toronto Sun and I walked through the newsroom, which was largely men, that I felt that there was a certain wave and it probably wasn't overwhelming friendliness. Um, but it wasn't difficult. There just have never been any problems. And that's probably because of media being one of the easier areas or print media. It was all based on meritocracy. If you could write, they wanted you. If you couldn't, you could be male, female, or in between, and they didn't want you. So you never felt limited by a glass ceiling? No, never. But look, I had parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. I mean, my great-grandmother in the 1880s came to England with three kids and four kids and started working right away in a country where she didn't speak the language and set up in business for herself. So it's a tradition, and it's a tradition in many European families. North American women grew up in a different kind of world. Like um, Barbara, I also grew up in an environment where I don't feel like I even knew of the concept of a glass ceiling. I always felt that I could be and do anything that I wanted to be um, and really to develop my own personhood and what it was that actually made me feel like I was contributing and making a meaningful sort of um, meaningful inputs into society. Carmelia, how's, what's been your, your impression? Women are now dominating, are coming up in the executive uh, field. Uh, there are so many female entrepreneurs and look at America. They now, for the very first time, have a woman of color in one of the highest roles of office and she's the vice president. So I think that uh, shows that we are making progress, but by no way are we equal. So there still is quite a lot to do. When you look at film and television, there still are not that many directors or executive producers or, the, or, or VCs or financiers. So we are making progress, but there's a lot more that we can do. All right, there's more after the break, don't go away. We prioritize youth to such a degree that even women in their 20s want to look younger.
Welcome back. For far too long, aging was seen as something to fight against, not something to accept and celebrate. This is especially true for women. Now, while society has made some strides in embracing aging and beauty, there's still plenty of progress to be made in how we view the physical changes that come with age. So I'm going to ask all of you about your opinions on plastic surgery and getting work done. Jane, what's your philosophy? It, you know, should people embrace their grays or is this something that we should be hiding and, and what's your take on that? Well, I think it is very individual. Certainly whatever works for you, whatever makes you feel better as a person, I think is the way you should live as you age. So far, I haven't had a calling to have any work done, but I do look at myself in the mirror. I catch myself having that moment and thinking, when did that happen? <laughs> you know, like, especially if the light hits you in a certain way, you think, wow, I, re I look the way I remember even my grandmother looking in her mid-50s, just for that moment, you know, when you don't have makeup on. But I think, honestly, I'm too scared to get plastic surgery. It makes me nervous to think about injections or slicing and dicing and that kind of thing. But it might change. I'm not ruling it out. It's just right now, no. I have had makeup artists say to me, oh, you could use a few filler, fillers in your laugh lines, or maybe you could put some Botox in your forehead. Uh, it might, you know, reduce some of the wrinkles. And I have to say, I haven't gone there yet, but I'm not opposed to it necessarily. You speak openly about having um, is it fat taken out of your <laughs> buttocks? And <laughs> you know, um, a friend of mine was talking to Jane Fonda recently, and Jane just had a very successful job done on her face in Arizona, I think. And she said, I could either hide or I could do it. And so she finally did it. And she's a beautiful, beautiful woman. I think, as, as Jane here said, it's very individual. I have never been the slightest bit scared of needles. I'd cut off my fingers if I felt it was the right thing to do. And it depends on your situation. I have friends who have aged magnificently and have never gone near a dermatologist or a plastic surgeon. If you're in communications, any form of media, you do think about it a little more. And I've had needles stuck into my face. I've had um, knives stuck into my nose. I think that at some point uh, it's going to be more drastic than that because if I don't do it now, nobody's going to take me because they think I'll die on the table. It's interesting because on the one hand, if you're doing it to make yourself feel better, then that's great. But if you're doing it because there's some sort of societal pressure to look younger, if the motive is to defeat age, then shouldn't we be fighting against that? Sam, what's your take? I, I absolutely agree. I'll tell you a quick story. Before radio, I was a TV news anchor and you see my hair and you know it's out of control and certainly distracting. And I was told by a male president of a major television corporation that I, he loved what I was doing on the air, but he was so distracted by my hair that I would need to go away and I would need, a need to find a way to have it straightened and to be less distracting. So um, I was told from a very young age working in media that not everything is okay, uh, particularly in television, and that I needed to fix what needed fixing so that the focus was on the news stories and not on Sam's crazy hair or big glasses, right? Right. Well, see, you know, Dr. Andrea, if we can avail ourselves of modern medicine to fix things like our eyesight and, and, and our hearing, you know, why not make some changes to our, to our physical appearance? Why is the former rewarded and the latter condemned? I actually believe that, you know, as a society, we've unfortunately begun to prioritize the newest and the latest, right? We see that even in technology. And the concern for me as, you know, I'm a woman in my 30s. I have not had plastic surgery. The thought of it, like other people on the panel, it actually frightens me quite a bit because I worry about it going wrong and me looking different than I want to. But I think that as a society, we prioritize youth to such a degree that even women in their 20s want to look younger. And when we look at social media, there's these filters that change the way that our faces look and the size of our features. And it's distorting what even young women think of their own looks. And that's the concern for me, that it's not just um, affecting women as we get older. It's actually affecting women who are in youth, who want to now appear younger because they, they don't seem young enough to be um, attractive.
You know, I think chasing youth is always a tragic and pathetic thing to see in an older woman. What you want to do, and I hate to use the word because it's so cliched, you want to look refreshed. You don't want to look 30 when you're 50. You don't want, I'm 80, I don't want to look 50. But you don't want to look tired. Now, as I said, many people go into their 80s looking wonderful and they haven't done a thing. But chasing youth is a horrible, horrible thing. And the pressure is on you. I'd like to pretend it wasn't, but it is, particularly if in your youth, you've been celebrated for your appearance. That's the toughest thing to age with. I think when you're doing things because you don't feel you're good enough, that's something to explore. But if you're doing it to enhance your appearance, appearance such as I'm here and I'm, I have makeup done. I, I cannot have makeup done, but I want to make a great impression. And so, and I love to get my makeup done and get glam. So those are the things that I would say to my clients is do it for yourself. Don't do it for anybody else. But don't you think that achievement is worth 10 years I mean, I used to say to girls when I was in my 40s, do something with life because achievement is going to stand you in better stead than any $500 bottle of cream. And it'll give you more allure, more attractiveness if you have come to terms with yourself and you have created something in life. Yes, achievement is great, but when the packaging looks a certain way, they don't recognize that achievement. And that's sad when we are living in a society where the, you feel that pressure. But I 100% I agree with you. But I think that there's a push, I think there's a rebellion against that now. I think, as I said earlier, I think that women that have achieved something, that have experienced, that have humor, that have passion, that have worked hard, I think that makes them uniquely attractive in a way that just, a boring old physical appearance could never do. But I think it's the combination of those things. I feel that I can't let myself down by letting myself go and using age as a reason to get heavy um, or not exercise because I have this experience and that's okay. I put a lot of pressure on myself to try to stay healthy and slim and looking good. Looking good is important to me, not, be, not because it's expected of me, but because it means something to me in addition to those professional accomplishments. Well, and when you look good and you feel good, then there's that confidence yes. as well, which yes. is a very attractive quality. Yes. There we go. Okay, I think we're all agreeing. Absolutely. Yeah, kind of. And can important. I just say too that there's an element of self-control that breeds confidence, for me at least. I feel, I feel in the driver's seat of my life, right? So if I'm making the effort to exercise that's healthy for my brain and great for my body, and just, I think I walk taller when I feel like I've done good things for myself. I think that the aging brain is part of the problem of aging, and it has to do with beauty as well. Because if you can think, if you have personality, it's all linked to how your brain works. And people are attracted by a vivacious personality or by a brain that can think, that can respond. So learning how to keep your brain young has got to be one of the most important steps to being, keeping your looks. All right, well, when we come back, sex, relationships, and how more and more women are taking control of their love lives. That's next. People kind of go, ooh, she still has a good sex life with her husband, and look how old they are. Welcome back to the show. It's commonly thought that as we get older, sex fades year by year, especially for women, but the reality is older people are often having better sex than younger people. Yep, it's true. Research points to several factors, including an increased understanding of how our bodies work when it comes to sex, increased self-confidence, and improved communication skills. So why don't we start there? Does sex get better with age, Barbara? Not to, not to mention experience. Well, there you go. <laughs> you learn new things. Um, does it get better? I think that it gets better from 40 on. I really do. Um, and I think it's very difficult to talk about at my age because people, are, they're almost revolted by it if you say that I enjoy a physical relationship with my husband. Um, I've had reactions to my book in which people kind of go, ooh, she still has a good sex life with her husband and look how old they are. Yeah, but, but who says that? Younger people? 
Yes. Well, most people are younger than me. I mean, that's a terrible thing you have to face when you get older. But don't but you think, Barbara, that's maybe more the older generation's way of looking at it? I don't look at it that way. I'm glad. I'm really glad to hear that. But, but you do get that. But the truth is that if you love someone, I mean, if you really love them and you're attracted to them physically, you don't see that aging. In your eyes, they're still the same person. I married Conrad because apart from his brain, he had these great broad shoulders and he was tall and he had agate eyes. That's all still there. And that still turns me on. There you go. Carmelia? I've done tons of research that says that best sex is in your 60s. Now, I'm 48, 49 uh, next year, almost 50. So I sex is better in my 40s. I've had better sex now than I've ever had in my 20s. In my 20s, I had no idea what I was doing. So, <laughs> And for the singles who are hiring me, whatever the age, 60s, 70s, they're all game and ready and eager to have sex. So yes, sex is better and still very much a priority for the singles that I'm working with over 50. Jane, is it is it better with age? It's better with age, but it's also better when you have the right partner. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my first husband is a great guy. He's the father of both of my children, but we were not right for each other. We were not matched physically, absolutely. There wasn't that magical physical chemistry that I have with my second and final husband. <laughs> um, so it has been, sex has been... Uh, a glorious part of my 40s and 50s that I didn't experience before that. And it is alive and well, ladies. But you don't want to make it another pressure on women. In other words, you don't want to make women feel that they're somehow lacking if they don't do it twice a week with their husband or they don't, whatever. Uh, I think we should always remember that sometimes it fades, sometimes it comes back, and not make that one more thing we have to live up to. Right. I actually believe that the way that we express ourselves sexually, that there's such a variety in different ways that we can do that. And it's not just intercourse. You know, there's touching and kissing and cuddling and all of the pieces that fall between those. So um, I think that we as humans get to explore what that looks like for us and what feels good for us and learning how to be confident in expressing ourselves with our partners and telling each other what we like and dislike so that we can sort of express ourselves and have a good quality sexual relationship. I, I think that's a really good point because I actually watched an interview of a couple that said they don't have sex, but they feel like they're sexually active because they do other things. They cuddle, they, they touch, and they, they're able to to be romantic and and, diff and sexual in in different ways well i was just gonna say i think the key chris and i have been married 31 years and uh, made a decision 31 years ago when we first met to just be brutally honest about what's good and what's not and to communicate everything uh to each other about what's good and what could be better and we've just maintained that our entire marriage it's so important to be honest right because why are you in it and why are you together and doing all this and finding a person for life if not to be completely honest in a diplomatic way about what works better for you and um and so it it's really the most honest and open relationship that i have ever had and i promised myself that that would never change through the ages and it hasn't it's funny because in a way we've been trained to lie all our lives about sex. I mean, men, when they orgasm, they know they orgasm. <laughs> um, we can have a headache, we can feel sick, and we still can pretend to do it. And that becomes part of our training, in a sense, so that we make the men feel more confident. And in that way, we have a certain power over them, don't you think? I've never faked it. Not once. Muzzle tough. <laughs> Can I also no, like, say if it I doesn't if it doesn't that? happen for whatever reason, um, you know that's fine. It'll it'll happen the next time. But, but it mostly happens with Myron. You know, sometimes men are are insecure. I mean, we are not the only ones that are insecure. Men are insecure, and they feel that if they don't give you an orgasm, then there's something wrong with them. It's not simply because you're older, or you're not attractive. It's their fault. 
I just want to end on the point of that, you know, if you speak to your partner's love language, first of all, arousal begins in your brain and your brain is your most important sex organ. So that's something that we need to be mindful of as we age, those insecurities, the, the um, you know, talking about what you said, what you need and communicating if you're in the mood, what causes you to be in the mood. I think acknowledging your partner, whether you are, your love language is words of affirmation and you need to hear that you're attractive one and appreciate it or whether it's acts of service and you get dressed and you do and you do kind things to you know create the mood so it may not just be easily fired up anymore especially if you're in a, a conflicted relationship it may be hard to focus on sex if you're not you know focusing on what you need on the inside what do you mean a conflicted relationship arguing stress okay. middle of the pandemic things like that all right, on that note, we'll be right back with more of The Zoomer. The COVID atmosphere, the loneliness, the isolation from normal social life has made it harder to be an aging woman. Welcome back. The month of March is Women's History Month when we celebrate the generations of women whose strength and hard work have moved us all forward and reflect on the work that still needs to be done. Now, Dr. Andrea, I want to start with you here. Um, we've just come through a global pandemic and we saw that COVID had a disproportionate effect on women. You know, what does that tell us? Well, I do feel like it's speaks to women's um, default way of being the nurturer and the giver and someone who wants to take care of everyone. And so when we feel like we have to contribute and support everyone and nurture everyone, and we don't feel like um, comfortable asking for help, that becomes a problem. And I think that that disproportionately affected women because they took on so many roles. And oftentimes we need to have this, um, unfortunately, we need to have this permission to ask for help. And so I encourage any women that are listening out there to identify some barriers that they can set up where they can take care of their own health and prioritize their own needs because asking for help is such a critical um, element of actually receiving the support that we need because we can't do it alone. It takes a village. And so we need to ask our communities and our the other people in our households for support because we can't bear all of the burdens ourselves. Jean. Could I just tell you if you if you've been a stay at home mom, if you um, have been working from home and helping your kids with their schoolwork during the last year, uh, which wasn't the case for me because my children are in their mid 20s now. But I just think your reward is going to come later. The self sacrifice that you have put in place over this last year, you will get it back. Uh, in multiple ways down the road when your children remember what you sacrificed for them. And I'm telling you, it will fulfill you with so much joy, even though you're exhausted now and it's difficult now and it hasn't been fair, but you will be rewarded down the road. Can I just say, because I am in that situation, yeah. I have a six month old at home and a toddler and I would not change it for the world. Um, Ah, oh, they bring me so much joy. <laughs> but um, I, I couldn't do it without my, my husband. And, um, you know, the two of us were a team. And so I think in so many ways he's supported me through this. I don't know that everyone has that, that kind of partnership, but I know that, that, that I do. Barbara? <laughs> well, as an aging woman, COVID has hit me in, in three different ways. Um, because we have different kinds of physical problems, osteoporosis, whatever it is, we need exercise, and you can't just keep walking up and down the same streets with no people on them, so your, your body starts falling apart. Mentally, women are more prone to depression, and I've suffered from it all my life, and even though you get new medications, and there is a new uh, antipsychotic medication, which is absolutely fabulous for depression, older ladies, let me tell you, um, Still, the COVID atmosphere, the loneliness, the isolation from normal social life has made it harder to be an aging woman. And on a lighter note, I can't do zippers up anymore. I have been eating a box of biscuits a day <laughs> and nothing fits. Today was the first day I put on anything but a jogging suit. <laughs> Sam, um, how is it, what does it mean to be a woman in, in 
2021 and throughout a pandemic? Uh, I feel blessed. Uh, you know, I'm married to um, a great guy who has supported my career because um, my husband is uh, in television, but he is behind the scenes. And I have always been front and center for a bunch of reasons. But, uh, you know, I mean, the career puts you out there. And Chris has never once tried to steer me in any other direction, but just to be completely and totally who I am. And I have a son who lives in New York City. Um, He's in his, going on to his late 20s. And I worry about him because, you know, I never stop being a mom. But I see his success and it brings me so much joy. And, and, now, and now look at Jane and me. Here it is, 2021, probably the worst shape the planet has ever been in. And there is so much need around the world. And we have been given this most incredible opportunity. I just, I feel like the year has been very special and challenging, but I have tons of gratitude you know, for all that's come to me and my family and my friends and my mom who is healthy at 84. It's, it's, uh, it's good. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, that perspective on that gratitude piece, because I feel the same way as a business owner, I'm running my brain shape platform, but being in lockdown across 2020 and into 2021 is actually being this bizarre blessing in disguise, because now I get to, you know, create and continue to send out um, and to publish my my podcast, but I'm also connecting with so many people online and it my business has actually grown because of the pandemic. I feel like people are more willing to communicate with me in an online space. And I've just seen this growth in my business. And I don't feel like that would have happened if the world were um, t- rolling, um, if the world was rolling around as it normally does. And so I also see this gratitude for this very bizarre COVID um, pandemic that has taken place. Andrea, have you seen any increase in depression among older women who are don't have the pleasure and the benefit of having children around the house? I personally haven't done any research where I could say whether that was true or not, but in a, on an anecdotal level, I do absolutely believe just from speaking to my immediate family that my parents don't have their family around, their kids around, their, our extended family. We would get together as a group very frequently, and now that hasn't happened in a year now, and that is absolutely taking a toll on them, and I feel like because my parents are are, they're both born in the 40s. And so they are getting older. And there's this, this um, misconception around um, men- mental health. And I feel like they're less willing to say that they need help or they need support and to look for that assistance. Because the whole idea of mental health, um, there's been a stigma for as long as anyone can remember. And that's starting to break down a little bit. But I want to um, mention to any of the, the viewers that if they are struggling with their mental health, it's so important to reach out and to ask for help because there's people that can support you and you can start to feel better. I, I, I just want to back you up on that because I don't think viewers really understand there are tremendous strides in medication, in help, and depression or any mental condition like that can absolutely put the lid on your life. Doesn't matter how beautiful you are, doesn't matter how active you are. If you are cursed with that, get rid of it. Um, that's, that should be your right as you age. All right, on that note, when we come back, final thoughts from our panelists. That's next. In these frightening times, you need a trusted source of information from a point of view that matters to you. In this special episode of The Zoomer, we take a trip around the world to see how people are coping with COVID-19. We're learning about the coronavirus on an hour-to-hour basis. Each day, things are pulled back in terms of what we can and can't do. The Zoomer is here to give you crucial news and information from a Zoomer perspective. Welcome back to the Zoomer. It's time for final thoughts from our panelists. Dr. Andrea, we'll start with you. 
Um, I just wanted to say that it takes courage for us as women to express ourselves and to be who we truly are. And so I encourage any of the viewers out there to really explore what it is that gives them joy and meaning and to have the courage to step into that light and to show up um, in the world as the best version of themselves. Sam? And I would say to, to be comfortable with who you are, to stop judging yourself against other people and to, and to look inside more and to be okay with all the nooks and crannies that come with getting a little bit older. Those are good things, right? And we can um, use our experiences to bring that joy to other people and to ourselves. Carmelia? Being a woman in 2021 is a time to celebrate who you are and you can accomplish anything. There absolutely is no ceiling if you put your mind to it. It starts with your view of self and really surrounding yourself with the women like here on this panel. It's been an incredible learning session. And the more that you can uplift yourself and be, find your tribe of women that can help you along your journey, I think this is one of the best ways for you to elevate and to really thrive in this year. Jane. I think now is uh, a time to look forward to older age, but also keeping in mind uh, nurturing of yourself, your health, making sure you're following up on all of your medical appointments, getting your mammograms and your pap smears and doing everything to make sure you stay healthy uh, into older age and also nurture the relationships and the people closest to you. And Barbara. Well, we've used the word gratitude a lot. Um, I'm grateful for the following things. I'm grateful for the interest in older women, because I think that's terrific. I'm grateful for all the artificial aids we have to help us age, whether it be hormone replacement therapy, whether it be the dermatologist. Um, I'm grateful for the things that help our brain and our mental attitude. And so I think that aging is a lot easier now than it was for my parents and my grandparents. All right, and that's all the time we have. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you soon. For now, it's time to zoom out.